In the previous segment, we learned about data matrices, so x here is a data matrix, and we learned about singular value decomposition and the fact that any data matrix can be so decomposed. We're continuing that discussion now with what are called principal components. The starting point is to notice that we can estimate the covariance of all the different experiments by just this combination of data matrices. The idea here is that the covariance between experiment number i and experiment number j would be looking in the data matrix. We fix the column number i because that's one experiment, column number j because that's the other experiment, and then multiply the two values for any given gene k and sum over the genes. And of course if we take the average of that, that's simply a sample estimate of covariance. Notice that this very definitely uses the fact that we subtracted the means off of all of the experiments. Now if I take this equation here and multiply both sides by n, and now substitute for the data matrix x its singular value decomposition, then we can see that n times the covariance matrix, which is just x transpose x right up here, um, and since x is equal to u times s times v transpose, and x transpose is this the other way around, what happens? u is orthogonal, so u transpose u is the identity matrix, S transpose S is just the square of a diagonal matrix, and we have a V on the left and a V transpose on the right. And you may recall that this is the form that shows that, the v, that v is a rotation matrix that diagonalizes the covariance matrix, or rather n times the covariance matrix. So a picture up here is that if we view our data as being approximated by some multivariate normal distribution in here 300 dimensions because there are 300 different experiments, then V is the rotation matrix. The columns of V are the principal directions of the principal axes of that multivariate normal approximation. And in particular, it follows that the data points x have their largest variance in the v1 direction because s1, the first singular value, is by definition always the largest one. And the second largest variance in the v2 direction, orthogonal to the v1 direction, and so forth. So if the data is approximated by this multidimensional ellipsoid or covariance matrix, then it's often useful to substitute for these Cartesian coordinates shown here that now have no particular meaning. Of course, they once referred to individual experiments, but now we see that the more meaningful variables are the coordinates where are we along the first principal axis, where is a given experiment, I should say a given data point, a given gene along the second principal axis and so on. And those coordinates are called the principal coordinates and we can get them by taking the original data matrix and right multiplying by the matrix V that came out of the singular value decomposition. How do we see that? Well let's take a given row of X which would be a given gene and now V, we dot it into the first column of V, but dotting it into the first column of an orthonormal matrix is just projecting it along that axis, and the number that comes out is the coordinate along that axis. Then the second column of V, similarly, will give us what the second coordinate is of each row when we do the matrix multiplication and so forth. Now since X is equal to US V transpose, x times v left multiplying this, I should say right multiplying this equation by v is equal to us because v, v, v transpose v is just the identity matrix. So sometimes it's more convenient to compute this as us, sometimes more convenient as xv. It's also easy to see that the 
principal components, that is to say the coordinates in this new coordinate system, are uncorrelated, that is they have a diagonal correlation matrix. In fact, this is basically by construction because we've diagonalized the covariance matrix, but let's just see that that all works out. So the correlation matrix would be x times v, that's the components, transpose times xv, and now xv as we commented is us, and now if we let the transpose act on this, we end up with a u transpose u in the middle, that disappears, we get s squared, a diagonal matrix, that's what we were trying to see. So let's, for this uh, gene expression data, plot the principal components of the 500 genes in, because we can just display it in two dimensions, two dimensions, the first two principal components. So the whole calculation in MATLAB is just these uh, basically four lines of code. This says take the data matrix and find its singular value decomposition, and that's U, S, and V then find the principal components or the PCA coordinates of that and that's just the matrix product U times S and then finally plot the first and second PCA coordinate there are actually 300 of them um, in a two-dimensional plane and let's set the axes to be on the same scale you'll see why so we get this picture and since the axes are on the same scale, it's a real effect that the dispersion, the variance in the first direction is larger than the variance in the second direction. And that's because the first singular value is larger than the second singular value. And if I plotted any higher coordinate, they would get flatter and flatter still because the singular values are decreasing. Let's look at, for that same data, how fast those singular values do decrease, or equivalently, how many singular values we need to explain most of the L2 norm of the data matrix X. Another way of saying that is most of its covariance. Here's a plot of the magnitude of the singular value squared, I can see here. Um, as a function of the singular value number from 1 to 300. And as advertised, the first few singular values are quite large, and there's a very rapid fall off, and then there's just a long tail down here. Now this is much clearer if I plot exactly the same data over here on a semi-log plot, so we can see uh, on a logarithmic scale that after the first few singular vectors the value of the singular values has fallen by more than an order of magnitude here and then it slowly continues on down. So we might look at this and say, aha, this must be the signal and this smooth thing here must be the background noise. Well, is that it? Does the signal go from here to here or from here to here? And I don't know, maybe this is all signal and the fall off that indicates that we're in the noise is occurring down here. So how can we get some insight into when are singular vectors significant in explaining significant features of the data? Well, one very simple thing that you can do is you can do an experiment of the same size and substitute completely uncorrelated Gaussian or normal random deviates for the data. So here I'm going to do that. I'm going to make fake data, which is just normal random values, all independent in a 500 by 300 matrix. And now I'm going to repeat exactly the analysis. I'm going to take its singular value decomposition and I'm going to plot on the semi-log plot the size of its singular values squared. And this is what we get. The blue is the same as before. The blue is the real data. And now, with fake data that's completely random and has no signal in it, we get this red curve. So it's interesting that we can see that probably this whole plateau in the real data and the fall off 
is indistinguishable from independent Gaussian random noise. And the real signal in this data is when it starts rising from this linear extrapolation up here. Now, why does the fake data show any trend at all? Why doesn't it have just all of its singular vectors about equal? Well, the answer, of course, is we've sorted them. They really are all about equal in any statistical distribution sense, but once we sort them from biggest to smallest, we get to see the order of statistics of singular vectors from a Gaussian random matrix. And that's something that people have worked out. It's nothing very simple, and in fact, we've numerically worked it out here, shown it in this case. Um, the reason the red curve is higher than the blue curve is simply that the areas under the curves have to be the same. In other words, we've standardized the data to be 300 experiments, all of zero mean and unit variance. And if the total L2 norm of the data matrix doesn't appear here, as in the real experiment, then it's got to appear here. And in a log plot, that looks like a bigger difference than it actually is. I'd say, as I already remarked, it's questionable that there could be much signal in this data beyond about here. Now, people sometimes make the same kinds of plots, but they plot them in a slightly different form that I find a bit misleading. So let me tell you about that. People often plot the fractional variance that's explained by the first k singular vectors or singular values. And their idea is, well, if after a small number of singular values I've explained most of the variance of the data, then there must be real signal here. The problem with that is that for the Gaussian random case, it's not this straight line up the diagonal, but rather it's this red curve that we get. Now, you might have expected, naively, that the Gaussian random case would be close to the straight line, because each random singular value should, on the average, explain about the same amount of variance. But as before, we're seeing the order statistics effect. We're seeing the fact that we've intentionally sorted them so that the biggest, in this case biggest by chance, uh, comes first. So if you only saw the red curve here, you might go in and say, there must be signal here, because I can explain, oh, let's do an example, half the variance here I can explain with only about, it looks like about 60 of my singular vectors out of a total of 300. But that's just an illusion. Now, in the actual yeast data, we get a much steeper curve here. And that's not an illusion. There really are important principal components in that yeast gene expression data. So for example, here, we're explaining half the variance with, it looks like, something like 15 singular values or singular vectors. Now, there are people who just love PCA, and I call them linear thinkers, and I don't mean that as a compliment. And if you're a linear thinker, you live in hope. You hope that the principal coordinates will magically correspond to distinct real physical or biological effects in your data. So here I've drawn a plot that any linear thinker would love to get out of their data. Every dot represents a gene, and they've done the PCA analysis, and maybe it, they would like to claim that the first principal axis, this one, corresponds closely to where the gene is activated in the cell cycle. Is it early in the cell cycle over here and late in the cell cycle over here? And the second principal vector maybe has some orthogonal uh, meaning, some meaning that's completely different from early and late in the cell cycle. So maybe it would be genes down here tend to be in the cytoplasm, and genes up here tend to be in the nucleus. Well, this kind of clean separation almost never happens, despite the linear thinkers wishing that they would. Um, it is sometimes, maybe even often true, that the largest principal component 
corresponds to some identifiable main effect in the data. So possibly that main effect could be early in cell cycle versus late in cell cycle. I'm not objecting to that. What I'm objecting to is the idea that something like nucleus versus cytoplasm is orthogonal in the mathematical sense to early in cell cycle, late in cell cycle. In other words, I think that the linear thinkers are a little bit confused about what orthogonality means in the precise mathematical sense of SVD. And the fact that orthogonality, orthogonal effects, are not the same thing as what we mean when we say verbally distinct main effects. In fact, distinct main effects will tend in general to be highly correlated mathematically. For example, it's a certain part in the cell cycle where most of the activity in the nucleus takes place. And so therefore, if the coordinates really were as indicated in blue, the dots would not be uncorrelated like this. In other words, correlated and uncorrelated mathematically is simply not the same concept as verbally orthogonal distinct main effects. And that's a potential source of confusion and misuse of singular value decomposition and principal component analysis. However, all is not lost. It is often true that somewhere in the subspace, the full subspace of the first k dimensions, the first k principal components, is being captured the first k main effects. It's simply that they may well not be simply orthogonal and along the components. So PCA is a useful technique, can be a useful technique for dimensional reduction. When the when there are a small number of principal components that are large and a much larger number of principal components that are so small that they're probably noise, then this is a good thing to do. The caution is don't try to overinterpret the meaning of the individual coordinates after perhaps the first one.